Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's Tuesday talk. We're so happy to have you here. Now, today we are very pleased to be hosting a talk on the history of computer art and digital art now. Now, this time last year, we had the pleasure of delving into themes of digital art through the gallery's group exhibition on generative art called Co Code of Arms. Now, last year, we also partnered with the Lumen Prize for the very first time. We exhibited the gold award winning work Uninvited by Nye Thompson and Uber Morgan. Now, this talk commemorates another year of two very special exhibitions. Harold Cohen's The Aaron Retrospective, which is here on the ground floor and first floor, as well as the winner of the Lumen Prize NFT Award, Aaron Penn, opening today in the project space. So if you haven't been downstairs yet, do have a look. Now tonight we will be delving into themes of early computer art and digital art today, and I would love to announce our panelists. So firstly, we have our moderator, Catherine Mason, now, Catherine Mason is an art historian and writer who has been involved with computer art since 2002. She is the author of A Computer in the Art Room, The Origins of British Computer Arts, and the editor of White Heat Called Logic, a collection of essays by pioneering artists working with tech prior to 1980. Currently, she is working on a book about George Mallon, who is one of the founders of the Computer Art Society back in 1969, which will be coming out later this year. Secondly, we have Alex Esterick, who is a media theorist who seeks to develop socially progressive approaches to new technologies. As editor-in-chief at Right Click Save, he aims to drive a critical conversation about NFTs, blockchain, and Web3. He is now the contributing editor for art and technology at Flash Art, establishing the magazine's digital column, The Uncanny Valley. He contributes to various publications from Freeze to the Financial Times and recently published the first aesthetics of crypto art. Next, we have Boris Magrini, who is the head of program and curator at HEC, the House of Electronic Arts, based in Basel, Switzerland. He studied art history and philosophy at the University of Geneva and received his PhD at the University of Zurich and a new media art in Sorry, and he regularly contributes uh, articles on contemporary new media art in magazines and exhibition catalogues, and has curated group exhibitions on topics of ecology, artificial intelligence, arts and games, and counter cartography. His book, Confronting the Machine, an inquiry into the subversive drives of computer-generated art, offers an, an analysis of digital art that questions its traditional evaluation. And finally, we have Aaron Penn, joining us remotely from uh, California. And now Aaron Penn is a renowned artist and engineer making it generative artwork with code since 2018. His work has been sold at Sotheby's, shown internationally at galleries and museums, and is collected by hundreds of individuals today. He is the director of engineering at Artblocks, helping to build the future of generative art as a medium. And in 2021, he was one of the top 50 artists in the NFT space globally. And he is this year the first uh, winner of the Lumen Prize NFT Award. So I will let you guys take it away. We will have time for questions at the end. Um, but yeah, enjoy. Thank you very much, India. Can everybody hear all right? Is the mic turned on? Yeah, good, okay. Well, I just wanted to start off by giving a little bit of history of myself. When, when I first became interested in digital art and first started to learn about it, back in 2002. Prior to that, I had a very traditional art history background um, in, the, in the early 1990s. And uh, this basically was sculpture, painting, and architecture. We had one session in four years, and that was on photography. So that tells you really about the very conventional art history background that I came from. But in 2002, I joined a project at the University of London and started to become interested in the digital. And at this point, there was very little to read about. There had been almost no books published. There had been literally one or possibly two PhDs written. There was almost nothing to read. Um, most art historians ignored it. Museums and galleries largely hadn't heard of it. And maybe they were showing some digitally manipulated photographs, a few progressive ones, but, but very, you know, that was about it. No dealers, commercial dealers were interested in it. There was no market for it at all that anyone could see. In fact, I don't really think it's an overstatement to say that nobody in the conventional, the traditional art world was interested in digital art in any shape or form at all. 
And we might consider some of the reasons as to why this, you know, why this was. But now we can fast forward to 2022, which coincidentally, as it happens, is 20 years later in my career. And we can see that we have one of the greatest first generation pioneers uh, right here, Harold Cohen, whom we're sitting in amongst in this gorgeous gallery in the West End. And I'm told by the gallery that the show has nearly sold out and that museums have come calling and that it has created a great stir and buzz amongst the press. So this does seem very emblematic of change. We also have a much younger artist here, Aaron Penn, winner of the Lumen NFT Award, showing downstairs in this gallery too. And many people think that NFTs are going to be the game changer for the future in the art world. So this exhibition that we're in here today gives us an opportunity to see the beginnings, if you like, with Harold Cohen from the late 60s, right through to the latest developments in this field uh, with the NFT art downstairs in one place. It's quite of a unique opportunity. So I'm very excited to be here and to have such great members of our panel. And I've noticed in the past couple of years a general growth in people wanting to find out about the history of digital art. And I thought we'd start off by saying, have, have, asking if any of the members of the panel, have you also noticed that there's a burgeoning interest in where this comes from and what is the tradition in which we can place this work? Would you like to start for us and just ask, what, let me know what you think <coughs> about um, the, the history and how you see mm -hmm. an interest? Yes, of course. And my microphone is on as well? Do, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, of course, you, you, it's, it's definitely true. Um, we, we are seeing a, a growing interest for digital art. And I think, um, I mean, it seems like an obvious um, uh, reason, the pandemic, uh, the, the arrival of NFTs, uh, certainly contributed in, a, in also in, a, in raising interest for digital art uh, among us, not only the, the, the art world, but uh, the, the broader, broader public as well. Um, whether that comes along with an interest for the history, I, I would hope so. I, uh, I think so. I think uh, naturally when people are interested in a, in a field, in a, in a production, artist production, then there might be some people that want to dig into it and, uh, and, and goes back to the history. I, I believe sometimes we have a little bit of a, also a, a way of filtering history, right? And uh, we always think uh, back in the days when we were not there. And then uh, as we grow older, we realize that the, the way, the perception we have for the, for the history is, is, is always a bit uh, um, shaped and, uh, and filtered. So um, Harold Cohen was uh, already an, um, a quite successful artist. Um, he, I remember um, I also had the chance uh, to interview him um, when I was uh, doing my research. And um, he was a very successful painter before he moved to California and then he started to to program and uh, and of course he lost some of his uh, success uh, by by delving into computer art, but nonetheless he has some quite some important exhibition uh, also with his um, with his activity with Aaron with his computer art. Um, it's true that digital art and on um, um, a broader sense new media art um, has been neglected uh, by many institutions, many festivals. But nonetheless, already in the 90s um, there was a really a already with the net art movement, there was a growing interest for media art. What happened is that some of the institutions specialized on, on this activity. I come from an institution that is also specialized in media art and electronic arts. And, um, and that is to be questioned if it's a, it's a positive uh, activity or, uh, or if it uh, helped to marginalize this artistic production. I don't believe so. I, I believe that having some institution and some festival arts, electronic or transmediale, for example, that focus on this artistic production, do not marginalize the artistic production. And we see also, we have seen in the past also artists that managed to, 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 to move between these worlds, between the contemporary art world and the, mm. and the specific art world. I think uh, it is a chance now, of course. Also, uh, I think digital tools become more and more present in everyday lives. And I see also in uh, artists coming out, freshly coming out from art schools, that they use these tools. Huh? Uh, they simply use uh, artificial intelligence or iPads and iPhones or software so for artistic production. And they don't even consider themselves as belonging to the marginalized field of a digital art. And that's, I think, it's a positive trend. Yes. So. Thank you. And what about you, Alex? You, you, in your publication, you have explored some history of this field, haven't you? So how do you see things developing? Is there a change? Are you noticing a difference? Well, uh, so first of all, uh, hello, everyone. I think uh, one of the things that s strikes me is the emergence this year of an interest in generative art. And this is obviously something that Aaron can speak to uh, better than I can. But I think um, without the NFT, without the marketization of digital art, 
that there probably is no resurgence of interest in generative art and, and possibly in Harold Cohen. Um, I personally, uh, having studied Harold Cohen myself, I'm personally you know, extremely proud to see his work being celebrated like this because he is a pioneer um, who was exhibited with Matisse when he was a, you know, a painter uh, in his own right as a human. Um, and so he did, like Boris says, he sacrificed a lot to, yes. to give it all up to program an AI to make the art for him, so to yes. speak, or with him. Um, I think, I, I, just to kind of, I, I'm not a kind of market, pro-market guy, but I think in the context of a crypto crash this year, I think um, that has created the conditions for, frankly, a publication like mine to do its work, um, hopefully more successfully, which is to say, when the hype drains away, what critical frameworks are you going to use to evaluate digital art, generative art, etc.? Yeah. So for me, um, I think there is a renewed interest on the part of collectors to find some, shall we say, kind of real um, historical or cultural value um, underlying this, this work. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, that what's particularly interesting to me right now is that uh, as we discuss pioneers of computer art, um, we also have this sort of fl extraordinary flowering of generative artists um, which is very exciting and, and is a market unto itself as well. Okay, okay, we can talk about some categories in a minute, but I want to go to Aaron. Um, Aaron, do you see yourself as part of a historical tradition? Do you see yourself placed within, within art history, the work that you produce and, and your, your um, methodologies and approaches to your work? Yes, absolutely. I think it would be impossible to do what I and my peers do today without um, recognizing the, the past. There's a quote that Frieder Nock said, uh, that I like to um, reference often, uh, that artists looking, you know, once they reach a certain age, look back and realize they've been part of silent conversations. Uh, the work they've done is part and parcel uh, with the work that's been done in the past. I think it's really important to recognize that and place our own work in the context. Um, this specifically computer-based work, uh, you know, from my perspective, the generative side of things, has been going on since the you know early 60s and, and much before in other types of uh, art, music, and land art. Um, but computer-based, uh, Vera Molnar, Herbert Frank, A. Michael Knoll, uh, Frieder Naka, all these artists have, have paved the way certainly for what I do specifically. I think it's the emergence and the accessibility of technologies um, that makes it so readily available to folks like myself to, uh, instead of painting or drawing, pivot to what has become a native tool, you know, using our computer to express um, ourselves. And I think it's um, it's right that we put that context uh, in the traditional art world. Great. So we mentioned there a little bit about um, that, that digital art is not just any one thing. We've talked about generative and it's, it, it encompasses a huge amount of, uh, of things. Um, back in 1969, the members of the Computer Arts Society, which was a um, UK-based organization but with an international outlook uh, and, and an international focus, a group of like-minded artists named it the Computer Arts Society, with arts in the plural, specifically because they wanted to encompass all the different approaches to using computing and digital information technologies, which could include dance and what we might call multimedia and installation work these days. But they had to specifically spell it out at that time because otherwise people wouldn't, people considered art to be simply painting on walls. So we don't perhaps have to do that this day, in this day and age, but do we have to think about um, names or definitions or categories for this type of art, or does it does it not matter? Is it is it ridiculous to sort of even consider trying to define something that is so nebulous and so wide ranging, encompassing such a large number of different people and different approaches? What do you think? Well, Boris? you know, and that's true for everything, right? Yeah. I mean, if you talk about music, uh, movies, literature, and art in general, um, I think that's um, that's that's impossible to to to, to want to pigeonhole one activity into some uh, categories and some, uh, some set of rules that, that, that describe the activities that you're doing. Mm. Um, going back to Harold Cohen, I remember in, in several of his articles, he always refused to be, uh, he, he, he even wrote an article that we say, I refuse to be put in a, in a, in a shelf, yes. in, a, in a category, in a label. Yes. And I never stopped doing painting, actually. He said uh, my activity with computer was actually a natural for him continuation on his delving into what does it mean to make a painting. And for him, using a computer was a way to, to um, broaden the, the, the research on that topic. Uh, I think, um, but this is something also interesting because, for example, if we talk about NFTs, uh, of course, NFTs are not, uh, it's not an art style. It's, it's, uh, NFTs are smart contracts. 
it's a it's a way to commercialize digital art and um, but on the other hand and this is where uh, it might be contradictory on the other hand we see also that some nfts that works very well for example the profile pictures or some um, gifts or some there is there is an aesthetic that somehow uh, becomes uh, popular and becomes successful and that do influence uh, in my opinion also some uh, some production mm -hmm. and so it's true, NFTs are not a style, it's not an art. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to commercialize artwork, digital artworks, but it might, uh, it might somehow uh, create some, um, some dominant styles in this sense. And, and that would be also interesting to analyze. Yes. But uh, as, a, as, a, as a general response, I would say, yes, it's true, digital art is very broad, and there are different approaches, different styles, and, uh, and rightly so. And so do we even have to say the word digital at all? I mean, why are we talking about the, the, the method and the tool behind it? Why aren't we just saying art? It's just art. What do you think, Alex? <laughs> I mean, why do we keep, why do we have a specific category that we talk about the digital? Why did I write a book called A Computer in the Art Room? Because I was trying to get people to realize that that dichotomy of, you know, an art room, a computer shouldn't belong in there. So, oh my gosh, but it did. So what happened then? So why do, what, because we don't, we don't talk about oil painting. I mean, I suppose we might have a, we might have a conference, I suppose, on, you know, on, 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 on methods of oil painting. I, but think, I think there is still people talking about painting and, and, yeah. and painting has never ceased to be exciting. Yeah. So I think uh, sometimes, um, sometimes it's useful to, to, uh, to have a, a category uh, to which we can relate and to which uh, there is an history and to which we can uh, somehow set some, some parallels or some institution that focus on a specific production. It might help to to get a, also a, a deeper um, expertise on that, uh, on that specific production, even if it's very broad. Okay. That's my take. What do you think, Alex? Do you think that we should just start talking about art and forget this business about, well, it's digital art or it's not digital art? Well, I think um, what constitutes art is very important and, uh, because, of course, who is not allowed into the art world um, is a political question as well as a question in, in many other respects. That's a um, good point. The, 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 if I may, the, the, the kinds of work that you're talking about, the, the GIFs and the animations that have emerged since the NFT, um, in a sense represent the output of uh, what you might call a, a, a mass global community of digital outsider artists so who, who might once have been described or self-identified as digital illustrators, game engine designers, etc., uh, but some of whom took on the name NFT artist as a way of sort of sublimating uh, the you know, rigorous craft that they always practice, but wasn't recognized. Okay. Um, so the question of what isn't, isn't regarded as art is, is obviously very important. Um, there are certain categories that have sort of emerged um, in recent years um, after the NFT, uh, including generative art, including crypto art, um, including specifically uh, art which critiques Web3 technologies like blockchain, yes. uh, NFTs, and smart contracts. Um, sometimes referred to as blockchain art, um, but a lot of the artists who are often labeled blockchain artists would dispute that. They're usually more com com comfortable being regarded as crypto artists or, as you say, just artists. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the language is in flux, and one of the principal reasons that we started this publication is to sort of track that language as okay. it solidifies um, yes. and so on. And would that be always because it's the beginning of, an, of a beginning? Well, it's, we're still a new movement, I suppose you could say. Um, uh, you know, even though we can trace back to the 1950s with machine art and Tangle and Schoffer, et cetera, et cetera, cybernetics. Um, but is, is it still, is that because it is still fairly new and so terms are in flux and so we shouldn't expect anything to settle down or be definitive? Or is it just the way that the art world has become very, very fractured and that almost anything goes and there's a little, there's, you're going you're to find your tribe from whatever thing you're interested in? Now, my perspective is that the recency, the the newness of it is a big part of this. I mean, the okay. computers have only been used for the past 70 years. It's only one lifetime past. Meanwhile, painting and everything has been going on for millennia. So I think yes. it's relatively new, even going back to mid-century. And it's a new tool bringing with it new processes, which potentially brings interesting questions you know, around authorship, around implementation, around dissemination. And the computer itself, coupled with networks, you know, with global connectivity, is such an explosive shift in the way um, we interact as a society that I think it brings not only new tools and new technologies, but also new ways of thinking and interacting. So I think it's just a very new um, tool 
you know, body of tools. And once we um, assimilate that into our normal everyday life, I think it'll be much more natural to say things like art rather than digital art. Okay. And would you, you'd be happy to see that, would you? You don't want to see this, these categories ca carrying on. You don't want to be seen as a subgroup of, of digital art. You'd rather just be seen as an artist? That's a great question. I believe so. Uh, currently, I like I like the term um, generative artist okay. or visual artist more so than um, digital artist because I believe there's a different set of skills and techniques and processes and history even that really imbue the practice of generative art versus um, you know digital painting, for example. Okay. Um, so I think I think yes, I'm happy with that category. But in the future, I think NFT art, digital art, that'll that'll go away. Those broader categorizations, those will just become art. Okay. And could you tell us a little bit about, you say there's specific skills and, and um, techniques with generative. How, what, what are those that you, what are they in particular for, for you? Sure. It's um, a little, it's a continuation in my mind of Solowitz's work, you know, of uh, conceptual art of mm -hmm. removing um, the author one layer from the output. I'm, I'm writing code or creating some system that sets in motion a set of rules that then in turn creates an output. And so there's this sort of unique approach to the authorship question, but also very specifically the set of tools. And I'm using code, uh, you know, a technical practice. Um, I'm not using a paintbrush. And so it's a, it's a different path to get there. Maybe there's no um, real difference between those things. At the end of the day, it's just expression with a different type of paintbrush, I suppose. But uh, it does feel good to say this is generative, because when you say that generative, it comes with a lot of um, interesting points. You know, there's randomness, there's chance involved, there's there's all these new elements, or not new, but maybe more unique elements. So to me, I would consider generative art as a genre unto itself, whereas I consider digital art uh, one facet of just um, you know, artistic expression. Okay. Would you agree with that, Alex? Would you have anything to add to that? Um, I think for, from the conversations I've had with artists this year, um, there is something of a consensus that generative art is a sort of catch-all term um, within which uh, artists who are perhaps more uh, directly working with neural networks, for example, are contained. Um, Sophia Crespo said that to me the other day. She, she considers herself to be a gener generative artist or an AI artist working within an envelope. Um, however, I suspect there are also artists who work directly with um, large data sets uh, or, or artists like Anna Riddler perhaps or Mario Klingerman who might refute that they are generative artists. So I think it's still contested is the answer. Okay. Um, but that's not such a bad thing. No, because with some contestation, we can have some debate. Would you agree with that, Boris? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We always need yeah. a debate and uh, yeah. we always have to have a debate. Open. But I want to go back to this, um, uh, what you brought up, which is uh, very true that uh, uh, a lot of NFT artists that became popular were not um, involved in digital art before. Mm. And, uh, and I know that there's a debate uh, about this production that uh, somehow um, irritates some people. And it's true that somehow we say, oh, digital art has been going on for decades and there are artists involved and engaged in this production. And now there are these uh, newcomers that uh, produce NFTs and become successful. Are you talking about things like Bored Ape and stuff like that? Right, exactly, you know, yeah. What you kind of um, think is, is, is that even, you know, can we, call, we can't even use that in the same paragraph as someone like Harold Cohen. Yes, and there are, of course, uh, many, many artists also now that engage with NFT in a very conceptual and creative way. You were talking about crypto art or blockchain based and also critical about Web3 technologies. And uh, I know there's a lot of also interesting production in that sense. Um, and, um, and I have a kind of a dual also attitude. On the one hand, I, I tend personally also as a curator to be more attracted to these more intellectual, conceptual kind of works uh, and, uh, and being more interested in, in, in curating and approaching these artists. But on the other hand, I, I'm also fascinated by the fact that, um, you know, um, we have to acknowledge also that there is this popular production and uh, these artists that uh, would have been excluded by the intellectual art world Right. And nonetheless, get a public, and nonetheless, get a, become successful. Somehow, I think it's a it's a popular phenomenon that uh, needs to be acknowledged. And somehow, I find it also interesting. Yes, uh, if you go back to history again, it's very interesting that um, uh, some of the great first generation pioneers, I would consider Harold, Harold Cohen among them, and indeed we also have Professor Ernest Edmonds with us here in the audience tonight, who is another great British pioneer, um, uh, and um, uh, they were not. Widely, they were not accepted during their day, um, and they struggled to get any kind of recognition. There was very, very, very little um, art world recognition in the early days. Um, so now it's a complete flip, isn't there? Because now we have people who are sort of outside the mainstream art world, 
who are suddenly getting lots of recognition. And I guess, or can get lots of recognition, it's possible for them too. So I guess that's partly because of the change in the technology, would you say, and the change in, um, you know, the fact that things have just progressed so dramatically. So we now have social media and we have ways you can promote yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, of course, social, social media play a, a huge role nowadays. Yeah. It's another way, um, I mean, back, back then, uh, um, the main channel were uh, very few and uh, they were um, very hierarchical. So, of course, social media, social promotion today, it's, uh, we have seen it's... Uh, it's, 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 it's like there were, there were a few art magazines and if you didn't get into those few art magazines, you weren't there, basically. Mm. And uh, what would you say to that, Alex? Because you, you run an art magazine now, don't you? I mean, I've been very resistant to, it, to um, what I see as the kind of sclerosis of contemporary art discourse for a long time. Um, by that, I mean... Uh, I, I feel like uh, the pennies drop that actually there's a lot of narratives that have been ignored over long spans of time and generative art is only one. Yes. Um, the fact that a lot of the most uh, successful cri crypto artists happen to come from either Nigeria, Mexico uh, or uh, the so-called global south, um, I think also tells you something about um, where the, the contemporary art world needs to go in order to evolve. Yes. Um, and I... I, my worry right now, and it's, there's a tension because from my, from, from my perspective, I think we're dealing with a vastly expanded art world, uh, which needs to acknowledge a set of digital uh, practices which were previously not sort of uh, allowed. Um, on the other hand, that takeover, so to speak, by or potential takeover or co-option by um, mainstream contemporary of the, the crypto art at grassroots communities, um, does threaten, I see it on a daily basis, it does threaten the sort of uh, horizontal and decentralized sort of communities uh, who have found success um, in, uh, dis, you know, outside of some of these hierarchical structures which pre-existed. Yeah, that's extremely interesting. How would that impact curation going forward? That's a, that's a, there's a, that's a big, mm. big question, isn't it, to try and incorporate people who've been traditionally ex excluded. Um, maybe, they're, maybe they don't even have art school educations. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think that's the, that's the job of the curators yeah. and the institution, right? Yeah. That's, that's why we also have an um, institution that are not, um, don't have commercial goal. Or um, I think that's, that's, um, it's up to the curators and those institutions to, to do their job and to do some research and to uh, offer um, a space for also artists that are not uh, commercially successful. Um, some institutions are more focusing on the history of art, some are on the present. I think uh, that's, that's an ongoing research and of course uh, it's very often subjective in a way related to the, to the background of the curators and the institution. But yes. um, uh, at HEC, for example, we try to be, um, to be we, don't, we don't focus on the history of art. We have our mission is more to focus on the present, on the current artistic production, but we try to be inclusive. We try to uh, open up to do research. And of course, it's, um, it's always limited somehow by the, the possibilities. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's always in the, in the back of our mind to, um, to also try to dig and try to find uh, the, the art is a production that might have been neglected as well. Yes, yeah. Aaron, do you, what do you, think, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think curation is becoming ever more important. Uh, and I think doing that research is, is critical. I think the curation element is needed more than ever now that the gates have opened quite a bit into um, artistic world acceptance. And I also think it's um, some sort of obligation that curators, gallerists, artists have to support folks who are traditionally underrepresented, you know, mm -hmm. uh, women, people of color, et cetera. I think now is a fantastic opportunity to really shine a light on uh, their contributions. So in a way, we could say that digital art, for want of a better term, that we're talking a catch-all umbrella phrase here I'm using, um, it could be seen as a democratizing, so po positive influence for the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. You guys would agree with that. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> you know, I mean, history tells us also right. that's, um, I mean, sometimes the, um, even what, even these decentralized um, structures, um, I mean, blockchain is, is famous for being decentralized, but then, Again, we have examples that show us that uh, sometimes it's not the case, even uh, with blockchain technology. So I think the potential is there, but uh, there is always also the, the, the threat that uh, some structure may, may be um, manipulated or um, uh, in the hand of uh, some privileged few. So 
I think it's, uh, and this is why also Ruth Cutler, for example, who published one of the first books on uh, blockchain uh, art, um, she said it's important to engage everyone in the conversation, right? Yeah. That's, that's why we are having these talks, that's why we, we need to speak about it, we need to involve the people. Um, also, James Bryan also was talking about the, the, the danger of artificial intelligence and, uh, and the necessity to, to, to be uh, to be knowledgeable about these technologies, and um, because we we need to have a, a larger public, a larger population involved and knowledgeable about this. Yeah, yeah. You've got anything to add to that? Alan? Well, I'm I think naturally skeptical of new mm. tech paradigms in general, and I think um, one of the I think one of the roles that uh, curators uh, or facilitators of um, digital art, generative art, uh, have is to make sure that. Um, it doesn't, yeah, we don't reiterate old sort of hegemonic structures. I think um, in some ways the blockchain um, NFTs and smart contracts can be used in a way which is potentially progressive. But I also know that there are ways in which, for example, a smart contract automates what happens in the future based on what you intend now, okay. which doesn't sound like a recipe for kind of, you know, uh, enlightened progressive uh, world. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, in a sense, I feel like there's, there's a battle going on for control, uh, progressive control of the technology. And I would say that uh, one of the privileges and one of, I think, one of the fundamental shifts um, that's taken place in recent years um, is that, uh, and it may be the result of the NFT, mm. uh, is that artists are no longer segregated in a way f and are commentating on the world from a separate position, from a white cube. Uh, they are, in a sense, capable of um, designing progressive technologies. Yes. And so uh, there are certain examples of the tech industry following particular artists in the way they're engaging with technology in a way which is critical, um, particularly surrounding the data sets used uh, to yes. train AI, et cetera, and so forth. So, so I think art actually, um, you know, technology is fundamental to both art and science, um, but the politics of that technology is, is a live issue. And that's an issue that artists are always generally engaged with. I have to say, there is a mar the, the market for generative art tends to be preoccupied with the sort of seductive aesthetics of um, the work. Um, but I think a lot of artists who work with generative systems are also very mindful of the ways those systems can be um, potentially turned to, shall we say, non-art purposes. Right. And I'm per personally most interested in that, um, although you know, I, li I like you know, nice pictures too. <laughs> When you mean the seductive, pro pro you mean the, the, the what we would call the sort of the aesthetics, the beauty, that sort, sort well, of. Well, there's there's a kind of ongoing hunt for yeah. the, the grail of, of uh, generative art, or what they call grails. So okay. these kind of outlier images, which are so exceptional that they must be masterpieces. Okay. Um, and that that it, that is uh, that is has created a, a kind of a very exciting market. Um, but I sometimes think that market detracts from the. The, perhaps the, the social implications of that. I see, that's extremely interesting, isn't it? You know, I was doing a, a, a talk um, a couple of weeks ago for the Australian um, National University and their School of Cybernetics. And uh, they, one of the questions that I was asked was, what are the masterpieces of digital art? So I think that's quite interesting. I mean, what, do you, what do you feel about the term masterpiece, which I think has some, some problems and some connotations and some history in itself, doesn't it? I mean, do we even need to think that there is a masterpiece? Why? But, you know, masterpiece uh, for me, uh, I think more in terms of what are the works that kind of made a breakthrough or kind of brought new approaches or uh, inspired Inspired people. People and uh, mm. and of course there are and it's very subjective. Again, you know, yes. somehow I, I have my own history of what are my my heroes of the history of art in general or, or digital art in, more specifically. And um, and sometimes of course uh, these these choices are also influenced by who go, who becomes more famous and who is presented where. Mm. So you're also biased somehow in your in your own history of what is relevant. But. Uh, but the more you study, the more you research, the more you can make, uh, make your own choices and your own selection. So I think it's important. And I think, uh, apart from the world masterpiece, I think it's, uh, it's also, I know there are some artists that have been extremely influential. And I think they, they deserve also the attention and the recognition. Yeah, yeah. But it almost sounds like you have to become your own curator nowadays, doesn't mm. it? Because there's so much out there and there's so much that... Well, frankly, good, bad, and indifferent, I suppose. I mean, I'm not going to judge, put, put any judgments on it, but you know, you, you have to wade through so much stuff. Um, so I, I think that's very interesting what you're saying. What would you say to that, Aaron, the, the um, having to wade through so much material out there and attempting to find something that is, that is good or, or, or 
is 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 that a useful term at all to attempt to make any kind of judgment? Do you think? I mean, I think from the curation perspective, it's it's critical to wade and find things that resonate. I think the good is very subjective, as as mm. was said. I think finding things that resonate or inspire you or or lead into some other conversation, I think is more important than finding something that's potentially aesthetically good. The stuff that is most interesting to me is using these new technologies um, from an extension of conceptual art. Um, you know, seeing the aesthetic and, and beauty is, is fantastic, of course, but using these new tools in new ways to extend um, some exploration of concepts, I think is more exciting. And so finding a masterpiece within that world is is quite different, of course. And so anyways, I think Finding works that resonate and inspire others, I think, is more important than finding um, aesthetically good work. I like that. Finding works that resonate and inspire others rather than trying to find a masterpiece. That's a very good question. I should have had that. I should have had that answer when I was asked that. Now, um, uh, um, Aaron, you have said that one of your goals is to inspire um, uh, other people. Um, I read that on one of your websites. Um, how do you find I mean, how, how do you go about that in a sort of practical sense? Sure, sure. Um, I think any artist's goal is to reach out to some other person and have some, you know, connection, uh, remote or otherwise. And I think that's maybe what I mean by inspire. What I also mean is to strike a note of curiosity. There's um, both a technical um, aspect to these works and, uh, oh, I could do that sort of uh, conversation happens a lot with, you know, minimal geometric uh, generative art. And so it, I think that is exciting. I love that. Um, inviting creative folks who maybe are not used to using a tool such as a computer uh, into that world and, and bringing them into this sort of engineering computer software kind of paradigm is fantastic because it's a practical skill and also a new lever that they can use. Also, I think bringing um, folks who consider themselves maybe more left brain, maybe more logical, more computer oriented uh, into this creative world and, and finding this overlap where you don't need to be one or the other as an individual. You can um, express the full, uh, you know, strength of your personality using these these tools. So to me, that's what I mean by inspire or, um, you know, engender curiosity. And and it's easy to do that in this day and age because of the internet, isn't it? You can, I mean, we can have somebody call in from California uh, when we're here in London. Absolutely. Well, the um, first generation pioneers, people again like Harold Cohen, um, they tended to emphasize the actual physical object. And in fact, we're sitting here in this gallery surrounded by actual physical paintings. Whereas much generative art today exists only on a screen, and that would, I think, include your work, Aaron. So do we think that something is lost because of this? Or is it just absolutely fine and fitting and typical of our time that we all walk around with little computers in our pockets and we spend huge amounts of time of our lives lived online? Or have we lost something by not having a physical object necessarily for art? That's a big I have, Yeah, I have <laughs> thoughts on this quickly. Uh, instead of something lost, I would say if used correctly, it is something gained. Something gained. Um, frequently, frequently with my projects, I make large scale prints and provide those to collectors. Um, and, and they look beautiful, it's a physical object, you hang them on your wall, you appreciate them daily. Um, I'm interested in creating light sculpture and I'll be working on some physical objects in that world as well. Uh, but works like rituals and um, you know, time-based visual work, of course, need a screen or some way to convey the movement over time and, and the audio. And so I think it's important to use the right sort of uh, display medium for whatever the artwork is. I think that's still important as ever. Which, who would like to go next? Who would like to add? Well, I published an interview with uh, a generative artist called Tyler Hobbs yesterday. Okay. Um, it, whose work is, I have to say, fascinating um, when it's printed uh, because what you're looking at, the marks that you see up close, are uh, ir not reproducible by hand. So, which is to say that they are physical marks, printed marks, mm. which are only con like conceivable um, through a natively digital approach, okay. um, which for me is, a, uh, and uh, to quote him, what's interesting for me is that it required computers and digital and programmatic thinking to arrive at a new form of painting that actually felt fresh. So I think that's that's very interesting, and, and uh, um, I think there's a, there's a, for, for Hobbes anyway, there's a kind of um, an interesting dialectic between the physical and the digital which goes on, um, and that this this idea of born digital uh, art. Uh, doesn't exclude, I think, the production of, of new objects. Of course, the NFT, what's interesting about that is that it, it creates uh, discrete digital objects. Yes. Um, and in, in some respects, that actually has a lot to do with painting. So. Okay. Would you like to elaborate on how it, how it has a lot to do with painting? 
A lot of people wouldn't see NFTs having much to do with painting. Well, okay, well, one, one way in which it doesn't have anything to do with painting is that the thing that you're buying is um, an, a certificate of authenticity on a blockchain. Right. And that I think the average time people hold NFTs now is still 30 days. Wow. Um, so display of yeah. discrete digital objects is clearly not or is not probably the primary Reason uh, for focus it. of that mm -hmm. work, but actually as a commodity it, it is. Right. Um, However, I have to say, we, we, we started, did, studied all the data, uh, all the tags on super rare around a year ago. And what, that, what, we, what we found was that um, 30 of the top 50 tags um, that artists were using to uh, associating with their work uh, had nothing to do with traditional fine art, but uh, five of the top 10 did. So you found words like nude, portrait, abstract, surreal right. in the most popular crypto art tags. Okay. So there are, as it were, there is sort of the, 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 the residual uh, influence of painting and canon, um, even on this, this sort of... That um, is really example. fascinating, isn't it? That makes you feel slightly better. <laughs> what do you think, Boris? Um, on, on this question, I had um, just a thought. I, I, yes. I, had, um, I was invited to give a conference uh, in St. Petersburg a couple of years ago, and I remember I, I was invited to talk about artificial intelligence and art because we just also had a show attack on entangled realities which uh, focus on the latest production on art and artificial intelligence. And at the end of the talk, there was an old professor, professor at the university said, but um, look, I have this painting here of this mountain. For me, this is a real thing. This is a real thing. It's not uh, this artificial intelligence art. And I, and I said, but, you know, uh, the mountain is real. Of course, you can go have a look at the mountain, take a hike. Uh, but artificial intelligence is as well as much real, as real as the mountain. We use it every day. It's, imp it's getting more and more pregnant in our society. So artists who approach artificial intelligence do approach a real thing, just like the mountain, painting a mountain. And I think for me, um, it doesn't matter if it's a real object versus a digital object. We can also start to, to talk about the ontology of what is real and what is not, what is an object. But uh, I'm naturally more interested in artists that approach topics that are relevant today and topics that uh, issues in a way that is creative, in a way that is original, in a way that make us inspire us, make us think about the, the, the reality and whether it's political or social or economic or whatever. And so I would say that it doesn't really matter at the end if it's a if it's a real object or not, or if it's a digital one. Uh, okay. What interests me is really the content and the and the okay. approach of the artist. Okay, and what it's trying to say, and yes. if it addresses concerns. Right. And one of the main concerns that I've heard people talk about with NFTs and indeed some digital art, they tend to categorize these all together. And we've discussed maybe why there's problems with categorizing things, or how difficult it is to categorize them, and how some people don't want to be categorized, and nor should they. Um, and that is, of course, the big climate change emergency that we're in, the crisis that we're in. So um, can we justify using all of this electricity, energy um, to, to maintain this sort of material? Um, does it have to stand up and speak for itself in order to earn its keep? I mean, that's a big question, isn't it? Let me, let me start with you, Aaron. Um, what would you say to that? Um, people who uh, would criticize NFTs because they just use up lots and lots of energy and they're built on tech which you cannot fix you you you, can't, you just have to replace therefore you just chuck it in the landfill when you're done i think it's a yeah i think it's a completely valid criticism of course and something to be very aware of um for what it's worth uh, organizations like artbox i think uh do a very good job of speaking as a representative of that company now that do a very good job of uh, being aware of this issue and doing as much as possible, you know, with offsetting carbon emissions, donating to charities and organizations that, that work towards it. Um, but I think also a larger scale, speaking on blockchain in particular, the Ethereum blockchain is the dominant force in the NFT world. And we just went through a large technical shift where each uh, computation is now done using um, 90, uh, you know, whatever the number was, a large amount less uh, electricity. And so the the climate change issue is no longer there for the Ethereum blockchain in particular. Speaking of computers, electricity, you know, digital screens, of course, that's still an issue. And I think that's more of a large uh, cultural issue rather than it is specifically an art one. But I do agree with Boris that the more interesting artworks are ones that maybe draw attention to issues such as this or have something to say beyond just um, aesthetic interest. I think even though these things are digital and maybe a little bit more material, it's still important to um, bring the soul and bring current social issues and, and politics into the art. You can't have expression without those things. So I think it's important. Thank you. 
Do you want to add anything to that? No. <laughs> well, but uh, you know, it's a big dis discussion. Uh, Memo Acton, uh, one of the artists, he is, I think he's one of the first who really published a research about how proof of work um, based blockchain technology are really consuming a lot of energy, and there's mm. a lot of discussion about proof of stake, proof of work. Mm. Ethereum just changed into proof of stake, for mm. example. Still, um, I think on the other hand, it's quite unclear somehow. I mean, those, uh, those research are also ambiguous sometimes, you know, um, some, somebody said that when you do a Google research, you consume just as much energy as when you mint an NFT or, you know, or if you, maybe if you go into the, what does it mean to produce such an old canvas, there's certainly answers on consumption of energy. It's difficult. I mean, it's, it's not to minimize because uh, the, 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 the facts are there. Um, mm -hmm. Blockchain uses a lot of uh, energy, especially proof of work. And it is something that we need to address, uh, but I think we need to address that also um, beyond uh, the simple NFT production. I think it's, a, it's, it's energy consumption, it's a, it's a big topic, and of course we need to be more sustainable. So yes, it is a, it is a question and uh, we, need to, we need to address it. I think, uh, and as usual, I think um, it's also um, uh, something that, uh, that should be addressed by politicians. First and foremost, I mean, of course, we are all involved in this conversation. We need to um, be more sustainable, but I think uh, I think that some some decision need to be taken in that respect on top level. I think we're just going to chat for about five or ten more minutes, and we'll open up for questions. Um, for something that is non-physical, as we've said, what kind of a legacy do you see? Um, how, how about you, Aaron? Let's ask the artist. What what would what, what is a legacy that you, I mean, you're very young still and you've got a, a long career ahead of you. In fact, you're doing very well so far. Um, but what kind of a career and legacy do you see for your, your work and indeed the generative art field that you see yourself within? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough question. I think that the exploring uh, new conceptual areas is what I would like the legacy to be. And maybe not quite yet, but that's the ultimate uh, goal. I think pushing what you do as an artist um, into maybe a little bit uh, an uncomfort zone, maybe stepping just out of your depth and exploring that area, maybe going into technologies uh, or tools or aesthetics or um, themes that are maybe a little bit uncomfortable. I think that's an exciting place to go. I don't know if uh, legacy is something I care all that much about, to be quite honest. I think I care more about the um, the people now that are alive now uh, and and making sure that folks are able to um you know have some curiosity and some joy with what they do and how they approach their day and if art is able to bring some of that then all the better and and when we talk about um uh longevity which i suppose is a, is, a, is something that goes hand in hand with legacy doesn't it how are you seeing your works progressing and migrating from different future into the future and different platforms Sure. This I would love to talk about. Um, Rituals, the project we submitted for the Lumen Prize mm -hmm. in particular, is um, conceptualized as an infinite artwork. If you let it play um, in a browser, assuming that the browser doesn't get unplugged, it'll play um, new forms and sounds for um, nine million years until a memory uh, issue happens on your computer. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the concept is infinite. Of course, that's not practical. Uh, and maybe in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the technology to run one of these um, artworks will have shifted. We try very hard to ensure that, um, you know, backwards compatibility, that, that what we use now is something that'll be uh, able to be performed in the future. But I think just like any sort of archival effort that museums uh, must undertake, uh, focusing on software art or digital art in particular will be part of that. The Ethereum blockchain, it's a decentralized system. You know, there's computers all across the world that have a copy of the artwork that generates the image that's showing on the screen right now. So if, you know, if half the world were to, to disappear, there's still somewhere out there Ethereum uh, nodes, you know, machines that have the code that someone could pull up and, and create the artwork. So the artwork won't get lost in a fire or a flood. It'll be uh, much more permanent. Um, and so I think that's that's a big, uh, interesting theme around this uh, NFT uh, or this art that lives inside of NFTs in the art blocks fashion, the code base fashion. Yeah. But I think the, the impermanence, yeah, is, is very interesting and now possible. Now as possible. long as museums and, and uh, folks put effort into making sure that that happens. Well, Boris, you're from a museum. What would you say to that? <laughs> to, to which aspect? Exactly? Well, um, the longevity. You know, there's very specific conditions. This is a very, mm -hmm. this is a big topic. There's very the specific con art. conditions. Well, we, we also have a collection of digital art, more than 70 works, and we have a... Um, 
uh, a woman who is specialized in uh, conservation of digital art. And it's really a delicate and, and difficult um, science, I would say, because mm. it's still ongoing. Yes. You think that you just keep the USB stick or the hard drive or whatever the artists yeah. give you. And, uh, and there's two, um, <laughs> also two um, missions that you have. One is to conserve the work and the other one is to um, make the work available. And of course, a work of digital art, it's, uh, it's unique because it, uh, it has um, mm. its own hardware sometimes mm. or its own environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a work, for example, based on the um, Google research image function, which changed over time. And so the work would, would not function, even if you kept the same hardware as, as yeah. back then, the work would not function because the same Google way. Because Google itself changed. Because Google algorithm. changed, the environment changed. Oh, so okay. it's a big, um, it's, a, it's an interesting science. It's, yes. uh, it's an ongoing science, an ongoing research, and it's very challenging. Yes. And, um, and, and, and it's fascinating, but it's important. And um, of, course, uh, of course, digital art can, could be preserved. Uh, you can keep, uh, and that's what you should do also, always make copies of the work in different environments, in different places online or uh, offline and art, in different locations, also geographically, especially for fire, because fire can also burn a computer, sure. <laughs> not only an old painting. Yeah. Um, but theoretically, yes, theoretically it can be maintained and uh, if everything goes well. You know, also blockchain, of course, blockchain theoretically are decentralized and, uh, and can go forever and are there forever. But um, some examples show us that it's also not the case always. Some blockchain can disappear. You know, blockchain are related. They, they, they function as long as there are a big community that use them. But uh, if, if a community stops using a blockchain, somehow uh, it, it will not survive. So, you know, there is a but on the other hand, yes, theoretically it can continue. And there are people who are specializing in this. Mm, yes, Would course. you add anything to that, Alex, about um, longevity of, of this art form? D does that concern you that things may not live very long or does that not matter? Yeah, no, it's a big problem. Um, and actually, uh, uh, if you if, to come back to that point about how uh, the, the thing that is secure on the blockchain, on chain, is, is usually um, the certificate of authenticity, so to speak, rather than the media, uh, the media in, in the vast majority of for the vast majority of NFTs, um, including the highest value, but price value uh -huh. uh, NFTs, is off-chain. Um, uh -huh. There are ways of securing off-chain assets. Um, I, principally, the best mode at the moment is, is something called uh, IPFS, or Interplanetary File System, which is, the, 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 I believe, the best form of decentralized storage at the moment. Um, but getting uh, NFT collectors to recognize the vulnerability of the off-chain assets is, is a big task. Um, and there have been kind of interesting efforts made to, to, to um, maintain works on-chain, either the seed that controls the generative output on-chain, um, or indeed a very, very, very small file. Um, there's a, a well-known project uh, by Lava Labs called Autoglyphs, which is, looks like kind of um, early Mondrian or Michael Knoll, um, which is small enough to fit on the blockchain, but usually it's, okay. it's off the chain. So that's, okay. that, that is a big problem. That is very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. All right, well, we're just going to open up to some questions after one um, to the, from the floor. After just one more, I want one last thing from the panel. Where do we think this is going in the future? Where do you see the future of this, Aaron? Let's start with you first. Uh, yeah, before I answer that, I wanted to uh, oh, mention sorry. one thing in particular about the um, Rituals project that we worked on. Mm -hmm. it, we created it within the Artblox platform, which has a very unique uh, answer to that uh, issue of most of the artwork assets being off-chain. The code itself that creates the artwork in, in this project in particular and our, all Artblox projects is on-chain, which is a very unique uh, thing in the same way that Autoglyphs, the Lava Labs project, is um, the code itself to create the artwork, which you can run on any um, computer or browser, uh, is in fact embedded in the blockchain. So it's a it's a new way to use the medium, uh, use the blockchain as a medium, I suppose. But uh, as far as where it goes in the future, keying off that, I think that's, in my opinion, the the future. Leveraging these sort of tools for permanence um, in the way that okay. they are for. I think that the word NFT is going to go away soon enough. Um, I don't think that. The distinctions we talked about in the beginning are very relevant going forward. I think NFT as a way to disseminate work is is critical and a way to show provenance and, and these sorts of things. I think it'll just be a natural evolution of our more digitally native world. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Where do you see things going in the future, Morris? Well, you know, when I get this question very often, I say I, I have no idea about the future. I don't, I don't have the capacity to see the future, but I rather would like to be 
surprised by the art is that, that that really challenged me with things that I would never imagined, and that's that's what I wish for most of the time. Uh, I know it's not a very satisfying answer. No, no, <laughs> but, it's, but that's the, that's the power that art can do. That isn't it? Right. I I think um, yeah. I'm, but probably I agree with Aaron. Things usually settle down, um, reassess. Um, you know, when they, when in the 90s, net art was developing, uh, there were a lot of ideas also about decentralization and also about yeah, some kind of a, almost kind of punk anarchic thought about <coughs> net art, internet. Yes. And then we saw with the, with Web two, Web two that uh, that actually was very centralized in in, in very hegemonic uh, softwares and, and services. Now Web three offered the promise of decentralization again. And uh, let's see. I think uh, again. I think the future is uh, that uh, that people are there to to ensure that um, in a way um, the technology is there also for the benefit of uh, of the society rather for the profit or only a some, big some corporations. People, yeah. yeah. Would you like to add anything to that, Alice? But where, well, given, where, where would you like to see the future? Well, I think a, a narrow answer is all, all I can offer, which is that I think um, it's, it's, it is um, important that we are now regarding uh, work by artists like Aaron um, alongside work by Aaron with Harold Cohen, so to speak. Um, and I, if I may, I just want to read something because um, we had something remarkable happen. Uh, our community manager, who has who's left, um, received an email uh, two weeks ago from a 93-year-old Roman Voroshko uh, saying, uh, remember me, uh, and a uh, very important um, artist who uh, christened, I believe, or he was uh, part of the what's called the Algorist uh, movement, and he was a close a friend of Harold Cohen. And he, we're about to publish an interview with him uh, next week and he said to me this he said um, Harold's struggle with the code always was to get it to that final touch where it was him but you'll never get there and I remember in the end at the very end of his talk in Vancouver he picked up something with his hand I think he had a pencil or a brush and he said well it didn't quite get there uh, but I'll just take this pen or brush and then he made a couple of strokes towards the screen that was it and for me it's it's beautiful to be able mm. to to speak of uh, Harold Cohen, of Roman Voroshko, of uh, Aaron Penner, and um, in one conversation, because yes. I think that before the NFT, that wouldn't have happened. And I'm glad it has, uh, because I think it, it pushes us forward to have these kinds of histories as live conversations, um, rather than um, sort of marginalized discourses. Yeah, great. That's a, wonderful, that's a wonderful point to end on. Thank you so much. Um, can we have some questions for anybody? We do have um, a, few, a few minutes if anyone has any burning desire to ask our panel who are extremely knowledgeable, <laughs> something about NFTs or any type of digital. I'll go with you first, sir. Um, right. Oh, here comes a mic. You're on Zoom, so. Of course, thank you. Um, I just want to pick up, uh, almost bouncing off the, the lovely final comments, which looks at the history together and, and sees the sort of correlations between from Aaron to Aaron. But the title of the talk features verses and that, that provocative term. And I was wondering if the panel see any sort of threat or danger between the, the appreciation of digital art now, either sort of masking or hiding those histories, or um, even from like a technical perspective, the sort of the visual aesthetics uh, compromising our way of interpreting and understanding what could be understood as more of a um, more sort of linear, simpler states from early computational arts. So is, is there any conflict between uh, the present and the past of computational practice? I don't see any personally, but I would like to know what our panel thinks. I'm not that. sure to understand the question exactly. I, you, you mentioned that the recent digital art might compromise the perception of the old uh, or the traditional. For example, in my practice, I, I teach, and one issue we have is that digital practice right now, the, the complexity of the image, the sort of um, what can be achieved with the technology often sort of outstrips and means that students aren't really appreciating work from the 60s, 70s and 80s with the same sort of reverence that they should be because they can't really understand that what they understand as uh, CGI or code-based practice right. has kind of outstripped aesthetically, so there's a sort of uh, a legibility problem for them. I think it's a question of um, um, sensibility and, 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 and curiosity in delving into the history of uh, whatever it is. Huh? It can be digital art, it can be literature, 
Um, of course, the technology today allows uh, off-the-shelf program that allows you to produce uh, exceptionally spectacular works. I think uh, if, if a student or a person has, a, has the curiosity to, 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 to dig into the history of the medium, might, be fi might find interest in, in early works. I, I don't think that the fact that the technology today uh, allows more uh, spectacular work would compromise the interest for the history of it. I, but I think it's a personal judgment. I think it's, it's a question of, um, um, how do you say, um, education, I'd probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Would you like to add something to that, Alex? No. We had a, we had a you, sir, wearing a hat. Oh, let me, have, sorry, let me, excuse me just one minute. I'm going to go to Ernest Edmonds, who's over here, and then I'll come back to you. Okay. Oh, I think Aaron wants to. Oh, Aaron, in the oh, meantime, sorry. just while we wait for you, Ernest, let's have, let's have Aaron come back. Yep, um, I, I agree, Boris, that it's a, a matter of education. I think uh, you as a teacher um, can help provide that context around what the world was like and when these earlier works were created. And I also think it's important to engender that curiosity in individuals to go teach themselves. One thing that I was thinking of, I have the exact opposite reaction personally, very anecdotally, when researching these older works and seeing, uh, for example, the outputs of Harold Cohen's Aaron system. Um, I could go to an AI tool and write the word draw a perfect circle and boom, there's my beautiful circle. But if I see the robotic arm that Harold used, uh, I think it's in the room with you now, uh, and imagine drawing a perfect circle with a machine like that, that would take me years and years to construct the machine, program it correctly, calibrate it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it engenders a deeper appreciation of the, uh, of the folks who came before us if we do that research. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Can I ask you, Ernest, to add your two cents, please? <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to comment on the discussion about objects and NFTs. Um, and maybe I could make a point, uh, maybe a problem, and suggest a solution. Um, the first point, the, the problem point, is that a lot of artists like Harold, like Roman, care very much about the object, right? If you take the painting on my left here and show it on a phone, Harold wouldn't accept that as the same work in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I remember when he sent me a, a, an Aaron print for a birthday a long time ago, he followed it up with a letter saying, I'm sorry, that wasn't good enough. The, the ink that I used to print it wasn't good enough, and I'll send you another one shortly. Right. The file was not changed. Right. So it was the same file, but it was a different realization physically, and he wanted to discard one and accept the other. Mm. Um, a couple of days ago, I was having a, some files printed, and the guy who was doing it for me brought me 20 different white papers that I had to choose from, and it was very important that I chose a particular white paper rather than another one, I thought. So th here's a problem, uh, because the NFT actually is about a file. We don't see a file. We see a realization from the file. The solution, I propose, and I'm interested in comments on this, the solution is to think of it more like in, in music, the, the file is like the score. So what you buy when you buy a file is like buying a score. And that isn't the work, the work has to then be performed or realized in some way, and maybe realized in many different ways, some of which are rubbish and some of which are brilliant. Um, and, and it seems to me perfectly okay to accept that but it might be nice to be more open about this aspect of NFTs. Would either of you like to comment on, on that point? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what Nelson Goodman, the philosopher, was distinguished between works that are, are unique, right, and works that are, can be performed and that they don't change, like a work of Shakespeare, whether you read it on a book or you read it online, it's the same work you're, uh, you're confronting to. But uh, I also think that uh, digital art, I mean, especially if you think about the, the early net artists of the 90s that were doing work only online and only to be experienced on your computer, also because they were playing sometimes with the expectation. Think about Jody, the, the pioneer of net art in the 90s. They were also playing with the, with the aesthetic of the glitch and the, the aesthetic of the viruses. And then they were also playing with your expectation and your fears toward these viruses that could maybe um, uh, interfere with your computer and your experience. So that's where you would experience the real work of Jody, not on a piece of paper printed. So it also depends, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thought you have, but I think, again, you will find examples that contradict also this, uh, this, uh, this idea. Yeah. Um, so I hope this isn't a reductive uh, introduction, but um, I was speaking to a, uh, an artist the other day who's called Gambrud, who, who works with um, 
AI. Um, and I asked him, uh, because he does, uh, he accounts for the ability to show work on a phone, on a screen, uh, on a, a large scale print. Um, and I said, does he privilege one of those, uh, as it were, methods of viewing? And he said, no. Um, and I, he is also a well-known collector. And I wonder, I know that this is a narrow example, but I wonder whether um, there is a sense in which digital artists are increasingly conscious of the, the inherent marketization of the object, whatever that, that is. And so I, I, I know that one or two artists do not regard it as um, their primary focus, but of course Tyler Hobbs certainly does. Um, and so I, I and would privilege the physical print over um, a, a digital screen at least at the moment, and because the resolution is still is still higher. That's my may I quickly respond. That's a very interesting point, and I and and I didn't refer to this, but I think it's also very important that there is a way of making art that has actually intended to work on different formats, like on a phone or on a big screen or whatever. It's uh, it's familiar in in the world of branding. That's what branding people do, okay? And artists can use these concepts from branding. And so that is another route uh, beyond what I've mentioned about mm -hmm. treating it like a score. So I agree with that. Would you like to add something to that, Aaron? What, what, what do you think about um, uh, something existing physically or only on, does it, does it matter or is it, does it just gonna be up to the individual artist for their preference? I think it matters. It's up to the individual artist uh, and the individual project what the end goal is, I suppose. Um, in my mind, the the end point for an artwork is when another person is experiencing it. So it, it's not enough for me to say the artwork exists uh, on the internet. Anybody can go view it on their phone or print it up or see it on their large TV screen. Um, I need to have some measure of influence on that final moment, I think, in order to get the, the artistic expression across in some projects. In, in other ones, fantastic examples of, of net art that's very particular. And in Ganbird's example, maybe it's not particular at all. I think those are both completely valid depending on the artist and the project. For me in particular, treating the file as a score is something that resonates very heavily in in this rituals project in particular, the score is is literally written out, the, the musical notes that will be played and randomly selected um, compositions. And and it will be uh, experienced, you know, by the user differently uh, if they have nice, you know, big bass heavy headphones or they have small, you know, AirPod headphones or they have a large movie theater sound system. And so one of those is my preferred experience of the artwork, uh, maybe not the right one, but definitely the better one. Um, so anyways, yeah, I do think it is very important to keep that final experience of the artwork in mind in my own personal practice. Thank you. All right, one more question, you sir with the hat. Yeah, hi, um, we talk about sort of conceptualism and do you think it's important with this work to have a narrative and to move it forward so people can, you know, engage with it? Should I? Whoever would like to answer. I, I tend, as I said, I tend to appreciate works that are, um, conceptually challenging and that they approach topics that are relevant to the society. But I also respect works that are um, pu purely formal research. So I, I really think uh, we should not give as curator prescription uh, what a work should be and how an artist should approach his own research, his own work. So I welcome all kind of experimentation. Uh, so in general, how engage in that well, of course, I think some works, uh, some works tend to be more uh, uh, easy to engage with, and, and some words tend to be more her hermetics. Um, I, think, uh, I think we should welcome all of them. I think it's also very difficult, you know, I mean, also that's, that, that's tend to be also delicate, you know. Do you, do you do a work because you are interested in that research, or you do a work because you want to reach the maximum amount of public? That's the difference between commercial art, whether it's movies, literature, or, or, or visual arts, right? So, what, what is your goal? So, if, of course, if you... you want to engage on the intellectual as well? Of course, absolutely, absolutely. And, and of course, uh, I don't say that it's bad to engage with the maximum amount of people, because if you have something important to say, you want to reach the maximum amount of people. So there are all of different questions that you might want to ask. I, I just don't think it's my role to, to say um, what, what should be done. Would you like to add anything to that? Not really. Not hugely. Not hugely. Okay. Erin, would you like to add anything to that? 
Um, just that I, I like uh, Boris, how you described maybe like a maybe not dichotomy, but two different paths: the the formal uh, yeah. approach and maybe the more uh, conceptual esoteric approach. With with generative art in particular, my of course very much biased perspective, it's very easy for folks to draw uh, primitive shapes, rectangles, squares, and create beautiful compositions with these very geometric approaches and have it be very formal. Uh, and it's very lacking, I find, to have folks express some more esoteric conceptual ideas. And so it, uh, encouraging both is is important. I think welcoming both is important, but yeah. Great. Thank you. Do we have one more question, India? And then I think we're calling it a night. Anyone has any final questions? Um, um, I think Aaron earlier mentioned Sol LeWitt, and I said, you know, I think you said he were, uh, was an inspiration to you. Remember, Sol LeWitt Absolutely. Um, said, and I'm going to misquote him, but effectively that the system for him was the creative act. He would create a system, a set of construction rules, and the artwork was the proof of the system. So it didn't matter how it was implemented and what, whatever, it might have a set of rules which say it should be done like this, but the art actually for him was in the construction of the system, mm -hmm. not in terms of the realisation of the physical side of things. And it just felt from the conversation that we were moving towards maybe thinking in that way that you can look at your NFT or generative artwork on a whole variety of different media. As long as it gives you access to the system, you're appreciating the artwork. That's very interesting. Want to comment on that? Would you like to comment on that, Aaron? Um, yeah, I think that is a very uh, important uh, distinction. It, it brings up a, a theme that I think about a lot lately. I'm uh, currently reading Dominico Quaranta's book in your computer, and there's a quote in there that resonates with this, I think, that um, the software art holds the concept. When I say software, I mean the instructions, right? The, the coded instructions. In Solowitz's case, you know, draw 50 dots, draw lines between them. In code case, you know, whatever the code says. But I think that the idea of the system, the creation of the system as the artwork uh, is, is, is totally valid. And now with software art, those instructions are uh, code rather than uh, human instructions. So I think it's an extension of Solowitz's conceptual practice, this sort of generative software art that's become uh, popular recently. Thank you. All right, I think we're done. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs>